Amen. 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 All right. The title of the sermon this morning is The Spirit of Fear. The Spirit of Fear. Look down at your Bible at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 7. The Bible says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, so much uh, for this scripture, Lord. And, and Lord, it's powerful. And Lord, we know just through this verse right here that any spirit of fear that we have on our lives, Lord, is not from you. And Lord, I pray that you'd help me to preach this sermon in boldness and power and not in fear. And Lord, that you'd fill me with the Holy Spirit as I begin to preach now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so today, all this coronavirus stuff is starting to affect Christians also. And this fear is creeping into Christianity right now um, uh, about this scare. And people are like, well, yeah, I, I am scared. Well, you know what? The Bible did not give you that spirit of fear. And so people are fearing being in public because the news are fear mongers and they're promoting their spirit of fear. And look, that spirit of fear is not from God. It's not from God. And so if you're afraid of your health and all this Corona stuff, look, people get sick. Okay. And that's, that's the truth of the matter. But do you think that God, you know, wants you to be afraid of every virus? He wants you to forsake the assembling of going to church because you're afraid of getting sick. He wants you to forsake being baptized or keeping any of God's commandments because you're afraid you're out of your mind if you think that. That's not what the Bible teaches. As a matter of fact, this is a big topic in the Word of God. This fear, I couldn't even nearly put it, uh, all the scripture I wanted to in here, but I, there's a lot. Okay. So that's what I'm preaching on, and this corona scare, this coronavirus scare is what prompted me to preach it. And so it's not just about the coronavirus, it's, it's just fear in general. Okay. But I will be focusing a little bit about that. And then I'm going to give you some health tips at the end of this sermon so you can uh, know what you should do. Okay? So let's look at 1 John chapter 4. Let's turn over uh, and before we get fully started in this. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 1. 1 John 4, verse number 1. The Bible says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they have they are of God because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And so the Bible teaches us, hey, don't believe every spirit. And, you know, I know this is talking about false prophets and we should try those spirits. Hey, whatever spirit that, that preacher has, hey, you should try those spirits and make sure that that person is really preaching what the Bible says. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. But, you know, there's, there's all kinds of different spirits that we can get associated with. And I didn't have time to do a Bible study on all the different types of spirits that there are. Obviously, we, we know there's demonic spirits. We know there's angelic spirits. We know that there's a spirit of God that resides in all believers. But also, there is a spirit of fear, isn't there? Because that's what 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says. God hath not given us the spirit of fear. So obviously, that's a spirit that makes us afraid. That makes us fear things. And you know what? It's not of God. It's not of God. So if you're afraid of something this morning, if you're afraid of the coronavirus, if you're afraid of you know, coming to church because you might get sick, look, it's not from God. Because God told you to not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And so do you think God's just going to go back on his commandment and say, well, it's in case the coronavirus. That's your, that's your little get out of jail, get out of church free card or something. It's ridiculous. God's not giving you that spirit. That spirit comes from who? The devil. The devil brings that spirit upon. Look, the news, if you think that the news has your best interest at heart, you're wrong about that. You know why they're pushing this? They're pushing it because they want to bring this vaccine out. That then they can make you all afraid again. See, it was the measles before, wasn't it? Now, you don't, isn't it funny how you don't hear anything about the measles anymore? Now it's just the coronavirus. We're all scared. Be afraid. Be afraid. So there are different types of spirits, and the spirit I'm talking about today is the spirit of fear. And we should not have anything to do with that. Look, and sometimes we get afraid. I get that. But you know what God says? Fear not. Be not afraid. So this sermon has two purposes. The number one purpose is I want to give those that are in fear a swift kick in the pants and exhort you to continue in the faith. 
And number two, I want to teach you what you really should fear. Okay, so there's two purposes to this sermon. Now the Bible says this saying 62 times, fear not. 62 times. So that's why I said it's a major theme in the Bible. And there's all kinds of other different variations of this. Okay, but the, the actual term fear not is 62 times. I'm not going to go through all those 62 times. I'm going to go through a couple of them with you, though. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 15, and we'll look at the first mention of that saying, fear not. Because, you know, you know who we should fear? We should fear God. That's the only person you should fear. Fear God. All right? And fear, uh, when, you, when you do something wicked, the punishment of that God, all right? Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, the Bible says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. So what's he saying? I'm the sh hey, if God's your shield, guess what? You have a really good friend. You have someone that is going to protect you no matter what. And he says to fear not. He told Abraham not to fear. And you know what? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him under righteousness. So he was saved because he feared God and he believed him, right? So look at Joshua chapter 10, verse 25. Joshua chapter 10, verse 25. I'm just going to show you a couple examples of this in the Bible. So Joshua chapter 10, verse number 25. So the Bible says this, And Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed, be strong. And of a good courage, for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. Getting hot. Trying to take the jacket off, all right? Anyway, uh, it says, be strong and be of good courage. And look, you know, being in fear is the opposite of being strong. Being in fear is the opposite of having good courage. You know, and when the Lord is the one that's fighting the battles for you, why are you afraid? Amen. Why would you be afraid of, a, of an army? Look, look Gideon, Gideon was, was afraid, but you know, he wasn't too afraid to listen to God and took 300 men and beat all those, all those soldiers with just 300 men. And you know what? God was fighting for them. That's why they won. It wasn't just because those 300 men were the baddest dudes on the planet or something. They just didn't lick their water like a dog, right? Or whatever. <laughs> so look at Luke chapter 5. Let's look at some New Testament Sayings and look, Jesus said this saying also. But so look at Luke chapter five, verse number ten, and it says it said, and so was also James and John the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not; from henceforth thou shalt catch men. So. Yeah, and isn't it funny how people are afraid to go soul winning? They're afraid of what's going to happen at the door. But, you know, Jesus said, fear not. From henceforth, thou shalt catch men. Hey, so guess what? That means that if you go and follow Jesus, guess what? You're going to catch men when you follow him and, and knock on doors and preach the gospel to people. And he said not to fear. Don't fear. So look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. Then we'll move on. To some other scriptures, but Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, it's the last book in the Bible, in case you don't know where Revelation is. It's the last book of the Bible, and it's the first chapter of the last book. In verse number 17, the Bible says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. You know who you should fear? You know, he said not to fear because he, you know, was John's God. He doesn't have to fear. He doesn't have to fear Jesus. But you know what? When he saw Jesus, he was afraid. Why was he afraid? Because he had long hair and he was skinny and had a little <laughs> dress on. You think that that's what he looked like? He didn't look like that at all. Right, right. His eyes were a flame of fire, the Bible says. Right. His feet were like polished brass. Right. He shone like the sun. You know who we should fear in, our, in this life, you know, of, of any person would be the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The God of Israel. And, but he told John not to fear him. Because when he looked at him, he was afraid. And there's a reason why. Because he was probably scary looking. If you saw Jesus right now, you'd probably be afraid too. You know, if you saw any 
angelic being, you'd be scared out of your mind because it's not something you've ever seen before and there's a lot of power there. So fear is the opposite of strong. Fear is the opposite of courage. Fear is the opposite of boldness. And we shouldn't have that spirit of fear. The Bible says that. So the term be not afraid is in the Bible 26 times. Be not afraid. And that is a, a, is a synonym of fear. Being afraid is being fearful, right? Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse number 1. We'll look at some verses about not being afraid. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse number 1. The Bible says this, When thou goest out to the battle against thine enemies, and seest horses, and chariots, and people, more than thou, be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So the Bible's telling his people, hey, don't be afraid of all these armies and these, all these different things. Be not afraid of them. The Lord is with thee. You know what? If God is on your side, you don't have anything to fear. That's what he's saying. Whether they have the greatest armaments ever, don't be afraid of them. So in the end times, we're going to have this reprobate army after us, right? But the Bible says to be not afraid. So which, what, what are you going to li listen to? The Word of God? Or are you going to listen to Fox News and Facebook and yeah. YouTube and the Drudge Report and whatever else you are listening to that's making you afraid? Hey, don't listen to that. Listen to the Bible. Nice. Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. I'll have you turn to 2 Chronicles 20, verse 15. I'm going to read for you Joshua 1, 9. The Bible says this in Joshua 1, 9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. God is with you wherever. And look, and if you are saved today and you have the Holy Spirit of God residing in you, guess what? God is with you wherever you're going. And he's with you wherever you're going that's wrong, too. Think about that. So when, if you want to be afraid, don't be afraid uh, you know, of, of the things that are going to happen to you, be afraid over the things that God might do to you as a punishment for your sins. But look at Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15. It says, And he said, Hearken ye, all of Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Look, God's going to fight the battles for you. Why are people so scared? You're scared of a little microscopic thing that, yeah, can it hurt you? Of course it can. But do you think that that's what God called you for to, so he could kill you with a virus? Is that, what, is that what he called you for? Oh, yeah. Hey, believe in me. Come to church. Get baptized. Go soul winning. You know, preach the gospel, whatever else. But you know what? When you do that, I'm going to kill you for it. Does that make sense to you? No. Do, you do you see how irrational that fear is? Yeah. It's irrational. And it's a spirit of fear. Second Chronicles chapter 32. Go ahead and turn there. I'm going to read for you in Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 6. The Bible says in Ezekiel 2 verse 6, And thou son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou doest what, uh, dwell amongst scorpions. Be not afraid of their words nor be dismayed at their look, though they be a rebellious house. So he's saying, hey, Ezekiel, I'm going to tell you what to preach. I'm going to have you preach all this stuff. And though you're going to have some reprobates around you, you're going to have some thorns, you're going to have some scorpions around you. You know, it's not talking about literal thorns and scorpions. It's talking about people. Don't be afraid of their faces. Don't be afraid of their looks. You know what? You get up and preach the word of God, as I've told you to do it, and I'm going to be with you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to protect you. And he told the same thing to Jeremiah. Don't look at their faces. Yep. Don't be afraid of their dirty looks and their dirty faces they show you. And look, as a preacher, when you get up here, any person that's preached behind this pulpit has probably had some kind of salty look thrown their way yep. because of something you were saying. And look, it's not what you're saying. It's what the Bible's saying. Yep. Right? And so people get mad over what the Bible says, and they get upset about what the Bible says, and they're like, well, you just don't understand. I'm afraid. You know, this is my special reason for being afraid. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's not of God. So, like I said, Jesus uses this exact phrase, be not afraid, seven times he uses this phrase. In Mark chapter 5, verse 36, oh, I had you turn to a verse, didn't I? 
What was that verse I had you turn to? Second Chronicles 32, 7. Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid, nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor of all the multitude that's with him, for there be more with us than with him. And now this is Elijah, the pro- Elisha, the prophet, and he's saying, hey, God, he basically tells God to show him how many people, how many hosts of angels and how many hosts are on our side. And then God opens his eyes so he can see the spirit world. And he sees that they do truly have more than what the army that they were facing against. And so sometimes we, we can't see, you know, our eyes of faith don't see very well sometimes and we get afraid of things. But remember, look, each and every person I, th- I believe has a guardian angel. Maybe you have, maybe some people need to have two because you're always messing up and, you know, the angels try to, you know, help you. I don't know. But I do believe that we do have guardian angels as saved people. But the Bible says that this, the spirits, these a- angelic beings are ministers of them that, ha- that, are, that are saved. They're ministers for us, for those that are going to inherit eternal life. And so they, just like Jesus had angels that ministered to him when he was tempted of the devil, we also have angels that minister to us. We just don't see. We can't see that. So, uh, so Mark chapter 5, verse 36 says, As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid. Only what? Believe. He wants us to believe. He wants us to have faith. You know, and he, last Thursday I preached about this, how, you know, he said, you know, help thou my, un-, the guy said, the, help thou my unbelief. Yep. You know, we are, we have a hard time believing sometimes, and sometimes we need to, need to go to Jesus and say, hey, will you help my unbelief, Lord? Will you help me to not be afraid? And when you're afraid, it's irrational. It's not of God. So guess who you need to go to to get that fear taken out of you? You need to go to God. Amen. So Acts chapter 15. Now, the Apostle Paul, every town he walked in, I'm sure that there was a little bit of anxiety, especially after he was beaten by rods thrice. He was shipwrecked twice. He was stoned to death, basically. And he was beaten several times and and thrown out of the city. I'm sure he had a little bit of anxiety about going soul winning, didn't he? You know, we don't don't have that anxiety. We have a fear of, oh, maybe someone's going to tell us to... Blankety blank you and slam the door in our face. What's what? How does that hurt you? I'm just like, okay, next door, you know. And God's going to deal with that person. And if someone attacks you out soul winning, you know, just you know, do your karate kid on them. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. But look, how often does that happen? It's happened one time in our church. And I'm not going to rehash the story. But, <laughs> The tale has been told many times. But, but you know, look, the, the person's still alive. They're still in our church. You know, they, they still look as good as the day it happened. I mean, <laughs> maybe a little bit uglier. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just joking. But anyway, so look, look, turn to Acts chapter 18. And look how God deals with Paul. And I, and I can understand how Paul would be a little bit anxious about going someplace. Look, if you've gotten beat down as many times as he did and went through as much stuff that, you know, the, the Bible says that I must show him how much, how great things he must suffer for my namesake. So Jesus, you know, showed Paul the things that he would have to suffer. And look at Acts 18 verse 9, but God was also with him and protected him. It says, then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace for I am with thee and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee for I have much people in this city. And so Paul was comforted by the Lord that day. And he, what did he do? And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. I don't know what it was about this particular place that made Paul anxious and made Paul afraid. But God said, you know what? Don't be afraid, but speak. Hold not thy peace. Don't be afraid to preach the gospel. Don't be afraid to preach God's commandments in this city because I'm with you. I'm not going to let any man hurt you or set on thee to hurt thee. Now, uh, let's look at uh, John chapter 14, uh, verse number 17. John chapter 14, verse number 17. The Bible says, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, 
so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. You know what? If you're saved today, you don't have anything to fear because guess what? The moment you close your eyes, you're going to wake up with Jesus. Okay? And it says, perfect love casteth out fear. He's telling us, hey, don't be afraid. You know who needs to be afraid? The people that have fear. It says, because fear hath torment, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. Well, how, I, I'm going to try to exhort you seven ways to next Sunday, all right? Amen. That this is not, this fear is irrational. And I've, I've noticed the irrational fear. And I, you know what I, who I expect to be fearful? I expect the world to be fearful. Yeah, that's right. Just like when they come back and they see the Lord Jesus Christ and they see that he's revealed from heaven and he comes back to get his saints, they're going to be f- really afraid. Yeah. They're going to they're gonna hide in the dens and caves of the earth and say to the rocks and mountains, fall on us! Because the great day of his wrath has come. Yep. They're going to be afraid. But you know who doesn't have to be afraid? Us. Yep. We don't have to be afraid. So again, I expect the world to be afraid. I expect, that, you know, I had a call from my grandpa. And he knows that I travel around a lot. And he called me and he, he wasn't... You know, he, he was trying to do something nice and just warn me that the first uh, person that got it in California was taken to a Sacramento area hospital. And he's like worried that I, because he knows I go, go to Sacramento sometime. And I said, Grandpa, I'm not really worried about it, honestly. And he's like, what? You know, he was, he was, he was, he is worried about it. You know, he's, he's an older, he's, you know, he's pretty old now. And that's what this virus is killing is mostly old older people elder people and so then of course that fear was trying to be passed on to me but i look i don't live in a world of fear right i just don't yeah. i don't care you know if god's going to kill me with the coronavirus then maybe i did something to deserve it that's the way i look at it so you know so if i die of it then maybe i did something wrong i don't know <laughs> but all have sinned and come short of the glory of god so don't get all high and mighty on me all right but, you know, this fear is passed on to my mom, and my mom lives with us, and she's afraid, and she's trying to buy, you know, everybody's bought up all the masks. <laughs> Can somebody explain to me the toilet paper thing, though? Like, <laughs> they plan on being at home for a long time. Like, all these grocery services have doubled and tripled their businesses where the online services will come and deliver it to your house. So what now, people are just going to be shut-ins? with their mountains of toilet paper <laughs> and their paper towels and all this, their, their Clorox wipes and all this other stuff, their masks, you know, I could only get two masks. You know, I heard somebody told me yesterday that Walmart was selling uh, hand sanitizer for $150 a bottle oh, for just like a bottle like that. So it's like, come on, people. You're really that scared? But you know what? I do expect the world to be afraid. When I told my mom I wasn't afraid, she got mad at me. And I was just like, well, whatever, mom. You know, I don't look. How does it feel? How does it feel to live in fear? You know, it's, it must suck. Yeah. So, but obviously I tried to encourage her a little bit, you know, but she, she's a little afraid. I expect people that don't go to church, that don't have the faith uh, that they're supposed to have, would be afraid of something like this. Yeah. I expect the world to flip out and get hysterical. And guess what? They are being that way. Well, maybe you should unplug Fox News or CNN or MSNBC or, you know, unsubscribe from Fox 12 on Facebook. It's Temo. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm subscribed to them too. I'm subscribed to them too. Maybe you should unsubscribe from the Babylon Bee. You know, no, just, it's my favorite news source. Anyway, um, but, you know, I expect that. I expect the, the worldly people to, to get hysterical and to flip out. You know who I don't expect to be afraid? You know who I don't expect to get hysterical? You know who I don't expect to be afraid and fearful about this thing? God's people! Amen. That's who I don't expect. Right. And, you know, it's, it's just sad to me that people that I know that are saved are living in fear over this thing. And maybe you've had some fearful thoughts about it. I'm not like trying to be super mean here. But, you know, like I said, one of the points of my sermon is to give you a spiritual kick in the pants. 
to help you to reel that fear back in and say, hey, you know what, I'm wrong. God, you're right. I know I shouldn't be afraid. And just repent of that, right? So let me teach you a principle as the Word of God this morning. I'll try to skip through. I have a lot of scripture verses here, but maybe I won't read all of them. Maybe you'll get it after maybe the first story. Let's look about. Let's look at what happened with Zedekiah in Jeremiah chapter thirty-eight. Let's look at Zedekiah. Look at his example. So this is the principle I want to teach you about this morning: is that the thing that you are afraid of the most is probably going to be the thing that happens to you. Because you're not living by faith, you're living in fear. And if God commands you not to be living in fear, and that's what you do, you operate out of that level of fear, then guess what's going to happen to you? You're probably going to be judged with the thing that you fear the most. You know, if you're afraid of spiders, a spider's going to crawl across your face or something. No, <laughs> I don't know, that's just an example. We got to overcome, you know, I used to be deathly afraid of spiders when I was a kid. I just, I had a black widow crawl up my leg one time. I think I've told the story before a long time ago. But I had a black widow crawl up my bare leg one time. And I said a four-letter word that I shouldn't have said. I was 10 years old, jumped out of the back of the truck while I was driving and kept running. Landed on my feet. It's a miracle. It's true, though. I'm serious. My brother was there. He was the witness. But, uh, you know, after that, I was afraid of spiders. But you know what? I just got over it. I just, I decided, you know what? I'm not going to live in fear with spiders. Not every spider is a black widow. Not every spider is a poison spider. They can't all hurt you. I don't like when they get on me. I brush them off real fast. Get the blowtorch out. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's not good to have an irrational fear of things like that. So look at Jeremiah chapter 38, verse 14. The Bible says, Then Zedekiah the king sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him into the third entry that was in the house of the Lord. And the king said unto Jeremiah, and this is, so Jeremiah has basically told him over and over again that the judgment is going to fall on Jerusalem. It's going to be destroyed. Everybody's going to be killed, pretty much. People will be taken away captive into the land of Babylon. And they're fighting against this, and Jeremiah keeps telling them, all you got to do is just turn, you know, turn yourself over, give up, and not, none of these things are going to happen to you, but he just won't listen. And he says, I will ask you a thing, hide nothing from me. Then Jeremiah said unto Zedekiah, if I declared unto thee, wilt thou not surely put me to death? And if I give thee counsel, wilt thou not hearken unto me? So Zedekiah the king swears secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, as the Lord liveth, that made us this soul, I will not put thee to death, neither will I give thee into the hand of these men that seek thy life. Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord God, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, if thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes, then thy soul shall live, and this city that shall not be burned with fire, and thou shalt live, and thine house. So what's he telling him? He's prophesying good things to him if he just gives up, right? But here's what he says in verse 18. But if thou will not go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes, then shall this city be given into the land, excuse me, the hand of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand. And Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah, what's he say? I'm afraid. I'm afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand, and they mock me. So what's he afraid of? He's afraid of people making fun of him. Because that's what mocking someone is. So Jeremiah just gets done telling him, look, this is what's going to happen to you. You're all going to die. The, the city's going to be burnt with fire. And you and your family are going to die. And he's afraid of his friends making fun of him. That's an irrational fear, isn't it? That's a dumb fear to have after Jeremiah just told him the word of the Lord. Verse 20, But Jeremiah said, They shall not deliver thee. Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord, which I speak unto thee. So it shall be well unto thee, and thy soul shall live. You know, I, I read it like that because that's the way I think that Jeremiah said it to him. It's like, look, dude, just obey what God says. He's given you an out here. And he says, But if thou refuse to go forth, this is the word that the Lord has showed me. And behold, all the women that are left in the king of Judah's house shall be brought forth to the king of Babylon's princes, and those women shall say, Thy friends have set on thee and have prevailed against thee. 
Thy feet are sunk in the mire, and they are turned away back. So they shall bring out all thy wives and thy children to the Chaldeans, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand, but shalt be taken by the hand of the king of Babylon, and thou shalt cause this city to be burned with fire. Then said Zedekiah unto Jeremiah, Let no man know of these words, and thou shalt not die. So he's going back on his word here. And basically what's he saying? I don't, I'm not, I don't care what you say. I'm not going to listen to what you say. It says, But if the prince, the prince is here, that I have talked with thee, and they come unto thee and say unto thee, Declare unto us now that thou hast said unto the king, Hide it not from us, and we will not put thee to death. Also what the king said unto thee. Then thou shalt say unto them, I presented my supplications before the king, that thou would not cause me to return to jo Jonathan's house. And so basically he's just telling them, here's what you need to say if they come to you and ask you the truth about what we talked about. All right. So turn, turn your chapter over to chapter 39, verse 1. Chapter 39, verse 1 in Jeremiah. The Bible says, so this is what happens. This is the result of him not obeying the voice of the Lord of him being afraid, more afraid of his friends and what the, the, the other people think about him than what God says to him, all right? Jeremiah 39, verse 1 says, In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and his army against Jerusalem, and they besieged it. In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, the ninth day of the month, the city was broken up. And all the princes of the kings of Babylon came in and sat in their middle gate, even Negleshazzar, uh, Sam Garanibo, oh man, I didn't practice these words, Sar <laughs> Sarshashim and Rab Saris and Neg Negola Shazazar, I don't know, I mean, I'm not saying it right, good night. <laughs> Rab Mag with, oh, I need Brother Eli, will you come up here and read for me? <laughs> with all the residue of the princes of the kings of Babylon, it came to pass that when Zedekiah the king of Judah saw them, and all the men of war, then they fled and went out of the city by night, by the way of the king's garden, by the gate betwixt the two walls. And he went out of the way of the plain, but the Chaldeans' army pursued after them, and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had taken him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and to Riblah in the land of Hamath, where he gave judgment upon him. And what was the judgment? Exactly what the Bible says was, said was happened to him. Then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah and Riblai before his eyes. And the king of Babylon slew all the nobles of Judah. Moreover, he put Zedekiah's eyes, put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with chains to carry him to Babylon. Poked his eyes out. And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the houses of the people of fire and break down the walls of Jerusalem. And Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive into Babylon, the remnant of the people that remained in the city and those that fell away, that fell to him with the rest of the people that remained. But Nebuzaradan, uh, the captain of the guard, left of the poor of the people, which had nothing in the land of Judah and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. So what ended up happening? Well, because he refused to listen, because he was afraid, his whole family died. His, full, his whole family was killed before his eyes. And the last thing he saw was his children being killed. And, their eye, and his eyes were poked out right after that. The last memory you have with your eyeballs is your kids being killed. And why did that happen? You know why it happened? Because he refused to listen to the word of the Lord. He had an out. He gave him an out. God was merciful to him. And what did he do? He ignored what the Bible said. He ignored what the prophet told him. And guess what happens when you ignore what the Bible says? Then there's going to be a judgment upon you. Yeah. Now let's look at Numbers chapter 13, verse number 25. Numbers chapter 13, verse number 25. This is also a lengthy scripture uh, thing, but you've got to have it for the context. So Numbers chapter 13, verse 25 and so God, God, uh, Joshua had sent out the spies to spy out the land, okay? And in verse 25, it says, And they returned from searching the land after 40 days, and they went and came to Moses and Aaron, to all the congregation of the children of Israel, into the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and to the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came into the land whither thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And the Amalekites dwell in the land in the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. 
and the Canaanites dwell in the sea, by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. But the men that went up with them said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we had gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sights as grasshoppers, so that we were in their sight. So what are they saying? They're saying, guess what? These people are too tough for us to beat. We're afraid of them. You need to be afraid of them too. Let's not go. Let's not fight against them, right? After God already said that they were going to be able to take over the land and defeat their enemies. So let's skip ahead into the story to Numbers chapter 14. The Bible says in Numbers 14, verse 27, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation, this is God speaking, which murmur against me. I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me, saying to them, as, I, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken to my ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless, ye shall not come into the land concerning I, which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and uh, Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they, will, they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in the wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness after the number of the days which ye search the land, even forty days each year for a year shall ye bear your iniquities even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. I, the Lord, have said, and I surely will do it unto this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in the wilderness. They shall be consumed, and there they shall die. And the men which Moses sent to search the land who returned and made the congregation a murmur against them by bringing up a slander upon the land, even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land, died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of the men that went to search the land, lived still. So God promised them that he was going to let them go into the, in the, in, in go into the promised land and everything, but now God breached his promise. He said, because, why? Because they were afraid. And you know what happens when people live in the spirit of fear in our church today? If someone lives in the spirit of fear and they pass that fear on to other people, you know what? God's going to be displeased with the whole congregation because of that. It's wicked. It's not of God. It's not a spirit of God. It's a spirit of fear. And that spirit of fear comes from the devil. Look at what it says in verse 39. And Moses told these sayings unto the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. And they rose up early in the morning, and they got them up into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and we'll go up into the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. And Moses said, Wherefore now do you transgress the commandment of the Lord? But, I, but it shall not prosper. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that ye be not smitten before your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword, because you are turned away from the Lord. Therefore the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up to the top to the hilltop, nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Then the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites and dwelt in that hill and smote them and disconfitted them even unto Hormah. So I know that was a long length of, of scripture, but listen, what happened? The spirit of fear crept in right. to the church. Right. The spirit of fear crept into the congregation and it caused the whole generation to fall. Do you see why I'm preaching this this morning? Because it's very important that you understand that you should not have that spirit of fear. Yeah, that's good. And look what happened. They, you know, they went without faith and tried to fight these battles, and they got smoked. Yep. They got destroyed. They got beat down. Because God was not with them anymore, and he took away that promise from them. Now, the last one I'll show you is from 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. The Bible says this, And Ahab told Jezebel, all that Elijah had done, this is after he destroys the 450 prophets of Baal, right? And with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword, and Jezebel sent the messenger unto Elijah, saying, 
So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them, to, as the life of one of them by tomorrow at about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. So Elijah, after this great victory, he gets told, uh, read, read a letter from a um, from this little old witch, right? that said that she was going to kill him by this time tomorrow. And so what did he do? After slaying 450 of the prophets of Baal and making them look stupid in front of the whole congregation, he runs for his life over some little old lady, you know, this witch, this wicked person, this prophetess of Baal. And so, you know, and look, Elijah was a great man of God. I'm not taking anything away from Elijah. He was a great man of God, but he got... He allowed the spirit of fear to creep into him, didn't he? Right. And so what's he do? You know, I just read this. I preached about this a little while ago about being depressed and, and how Elijah got depressed and all this. And he was afraid. But I want to skip through to, the, to verse, uh, chapter 19, verse 9. And I'll show you something here that's pretty interesting. And he came thither unto the cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken my covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. He's afraid. He's afraid. So it says, and he said, go forth and stand upon the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And the great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after that, after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after that, a still, small voice. You know, people are looking for God in the wrong places today. People are looking for God in the rock concerts that are at some of these churches. People are looking for God in Fox News, uh, watching Fox News. You know, most of these pastors in independent Baptist churches, they post more about politics than they do about, about God. They're looking for God in the wrong places, looking for some man to take care of them. Oh, please save us, Donald Trump, from the coronavirus. You better get serious about God because Trump is not going to be the one that saves us. Neither is Bernie, for that matter. He's even more wicked. But look, People are looking for God in the wrong places. Look, he wasn't, God was not found in the wind, was he? He wasn't found on Fox. He's not found on Fox News. Okay? He wasn't with, you know, God wasn't in the earthquake. Yeah. You know, God didn't say, I'm going to reveal myself on Facebook, did he? He's, you know, he says uh, he was not in the earthquake and he was not in the fire either. You know, he wasn't on the YouTube comments. He wasn't on the news channel that you're watching, whatever it is. That's making you afraid. You know where God is? Uh, he's, he's, in this, he's a still small voice. Yeah. And you know what? If you read this book, you better be listening to the still small voice of God. Look, I'm up here preaching to you. I might be, have a loud voice today. But look, I'm preaching to you what the still small voice says. Yep. I'm preaching to you what the Bible says about Amen. it. Who cares what Fox News says? Right. Who cares what Facebook says? Right. Who cares what the media says? Look, you've got to get your direction from the Word of God. You've got to get your direction from this book, the still small voice in this book. Yeah. And you know what it says? God has not given us the spirit of fear, right. but of power and of love and a sound mind. Yeah. He's not given us the spirit of fear. You got that spirit from somebody else, and you need to get that spirit out of your life. Amen. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Fear not. And you know what? Elijah went off and did great things for God after that. But he was afraid, and God straightened him out, didn't he? And we need to look at the still, small voice of God in this book. And look, I'm preaching to you that still, small voice today. Listen to the Bible. Listen to what the Bible says. Read the Bible Read what the Bible says. Because those examples that I gave to you, look, good things didn't happen when they didn't go with the commandments. Bad things happened to them. The worst possible things that could be imagined happened to Zedekiah. Why? Because he wouldn't listen to the word of God. Why was Elijah running for his life from a little old lady? The spirit of fear crept into him from the devil. Okay? 
And so, and same thing with the spies of Jericho. God was about to give them the land, and then what ended up happening to them when they dis disobeyed the word of God, they all got destroyed. They couldn't, they couldn't even leave the promised land. So, look, if your plan is to stay home because the, you're afraid of the coronavirus getting out of church, guess what? The Bible says to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but, so, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Not so much the last as you see the coronavirus approaching. We need to fear God over some stupid virus. Revelation 21 verse 7 says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I'll be his God, and he shall be my son. But guess what? As soon as you become my son, I'm going to kill you with the coronavirus. That's stupid. That's an irrational fear. It's an irrational thought. But you know what the Bible does say in, in Revelation chapter 21 verse 8? It says, but the fearful. It's a sin to be fearful. Did you know that? But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Hey, do you want to be listed with the fearful? Do you want to be listed as someone that was afraid to go to church because of this or that? Or you were afraid to get baptized because there's a community pool? That's ridiculous. There's chlorine in the pool. What's wrong with you? Yeah, Jesus commanded us to be baptized, did he not? Matthew 28, verse 18 says, Then Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, unless the coronavirus comes, and then you should be afraid to get dunked in a community pool. Is that what it says? No, it doesn't say that. It says, Teaching them to deserve all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. All power is given to Jesus in heaven and earth. And you know what he said? Go get baptized. That's the first thing you're supposed to do after you get saved is get baptized. Why? Because God said so. That's why. What, reason, what other reason do you have to have? But I'm afraid. Look, I think I've proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that we're not supposed to be afraid. We're not supposed to live in fear. And back to the church attendance thing, okay? I, I, I jumped the gun there. I want to show you the, the whole passage here. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Because look, I understand people are afraid of getting sick. I understand people are afraid of this and that. But look, just practice some good hygiene and you, you won't have to worry about that. I'll talk about that at the end of the sermon. But uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Forsaking means, hey, I'm not going to go to church. It says, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day? The day of Christ. The day that Christ comes back. He says, go to church more, not less. But isn't it funny and funny that people go to church less than they go more? The opposite of what God is saying. And guess what? Just like Zedekiah, you're giving... You know, look, you're not going to be free from this. After I read these scriptures to you, you're going to, you know, when you say, oh, I just, you know, I don't care about going to church. The Bible doesn't say to go to church every three times a week. Okay. It says go so much the more as you see the day approaching. So if we have three services a week that you can go to, you should probably try to go to them. Now, obviously, if you live far away, I don't expect you to do that. But I expect that people should go to church, right? So look at what it says. Four. Verse 26, for if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for the judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. So what should you look for? The same fiery judgment and indignation that's going to happen to those people? Guess what? God's going to get on your case because you're willfully sinning and not going to church. Is that what it's talking about or not? Am I taking this out of context? Am I trying to fear monger you? No. I'm try well, I am. I'm trying to f have you have the fear of the Lord, which is what you should have. It says, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose he that he be thought worthy who hath trodden under the foot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified 
an unholy thing. And guess what? If you say, you know, the blood of the, the what is the church? The church is where we, you know, the, what Christ died for. And you're going to say, you know, it's an unholy thing. It's going to, it's going to defile me. I'm going to be coronavirus when I come to church. You know, that's basically what you're saying. It's an unholy thing. It's an, it's an unclean thing. I can't go. I'm just going to watch online. It says, and have done despite the spirit of grace. You've been given the spirit of grace. If you just say, you know what, I'm going to lay out of church because I'm afraid. If you say, I'm not going to get baptized, I'm afraid. If you say, I'm not going to go soul winning because I'm afraid. Then guess what? God's not going to hold you guiltless over that. It says, for we know him that hath said, vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, what does it say? The Lord shall judge his people. So guess what? When you're laying out because you think the coronavirus is going to be here, if you're just not doing something that God commanded you to do, guess what's going to happen to you? The thing that you fear the most is the thing that's going to happen to you. So you can bolt the doors. You can have a clean room at home. You can you know, have all your stuff delivered and spray with hand sanitizer and all this other stuff that comes into the door. But guess what? If God's, you know, God's going to judge you for the thing that he commanded you to do, and instead you decide to be afraid of something else, guess what? The coronavirus is going to come right up your nose and right in your brain. And the thing that you fear the most is what's going to happen to you. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You know what you should be afraid of? You should be afraid of that. I'm afraid of those statements. Amen. So Luke chapter 12, verse 4, I'll have you turn over there. Luke chapter 12, verse 4, I'm getting close to wrapping this up. Luke chapter 12, verse number 4, the Bible says, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. Would that include a virus that could kill you? Yeah. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him, which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Who should we fear today? We should fear God. We should fear uh, him that could kill the body and throw you into hell. Now, obviously, if you're saved, he's not going to throw you into hell, but, you know, he will judge his people. Okay? It says, are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. He ha he, it's not that he knows, you know, he knows the number of how many hairs each person in this room has on their head. That's how much he loves us. That's how much he cares for us. And so why would we fear a little bug that you can't even see and be afraid of that over being afraid of God? Amen. That makes zero sense. He says, fear not, therefore. You're more of more value than many sparrows. God loves you more than the birds. God loves you more than the bees. God loves you more than the bears. God loves you more than the dogs and the cats and anything else in this world. He loves us more than anything. Our hairs on our head are numbered. I don't know how many I have right here. It's not as much as I have right here. And I can see some of you are in the same boat as I am. Maybe worse. But I'll tell you what, God knows how many hairs are on your head regardless. So again, so here's some questions to answer. Did God call you to serve him just so he could kill you with the coronavirus? Is that what he did? Did God ask you to be baptized just to kill you for not obeying him and to get baptized at a public pool? Is that what he did? He's like, oh yeah, go ahead and you know, move your whole family over here. Get baptized. And then as soon as you go into the public pool, <clears throat> you're baptized and you die like three days later or something. That's stupid. That's irrational fear. Does God command you to not forsake the assembling together at church every week so that he can kill you with some plague? Does he want you to just skip church? No, he doesn't. He wants you to go and do what he says, and then those things won't come upon you. Does that make sense? I mean, does the sermon make sense to you this morning? I hope it does. So... Let me ask you this, per O thou of little faith, O thou that's afraid of everything, O thou that's afraid of the coronavirus coming and killing them in their sleep, how does it feel to live in fear? It probably sucks. 
You know what? You don't have to live in fear. And you know what? I'm only asking this question because I don't understand it. Yeah. Doesn't compute. I've been afraid of things in my life. I'll, I'll admit that. But I don't live in fear. I don't have two hand sanitizers strapped to a helmet that I can squirt on my hands at all times. You know what I mean? I'm not walking around with a hand, bottle of hand sanitizer. You know what we did? We instituted the Corona fist pump. All right? Get to that in just a second. But yeah, explain how, how it feels to live in fear after the service to me, somebody, because I don't understand it. Because God does not give us that spirit. And you know what? I don't have that spirit, and I don't want that spirit creeping into our church. That's good. I don't want you going around. If you're the one that's scared, don't pass on your unbelief and your fear to other people in this church. Good. How do we stop the coronavirus from getting us? Number one, fear God and keep his commandments. Amen. Fear God and keep his commandments. Number two, take care of your Ferrari. Your body is like a Ferrari. You don't put stickers on it, okay, number one. But you should treat it well. Eat healthy. You know, eat stuff that's going to give you some kind of a nutrition. That'll help you. If you're tra But here, here's the thing. And I'll, I'm going to say this. I'm going to try to be really nice about this, okay? If you're trusting in your apple cider vinegar, garlic drops, colloidal silver, thieves oil, iron droplets, elderberry syrup, organic brand of fill-in-the-blank, non-GMO, grass-fed, raw milk, raw goat's milk, instead of the Lord to keep you healthy, you're just like the Vaxxers are. Because look, I just read you a long list of stuff, and that's not even the whole list. But look, listen to me. If you took that stuff literally every single day, you're probably going to be sick from taking all that stuff. <laughs> I'm serious. Look, if you're trusting in something besides God to keep you healthy, then you're trusting in the wrong thing. Amen. If you're trusting in the hospital and the doctors and everything else to keep you healthy, guess what? You're trusting in the wrong thing. Yeah, amen. If you're trusting in Western medicine and all that stuff. And look, I know I like to to harass you guys about this stuff. But listen to me. There's got to be a balance in your life. Yeah, that's good. All right? Yeah. And so while I'm getting onto this, because what do the vaxxers do? They're like, well, if I just get all these vaccines, then I'll be healthy, and I'll be like, you know, I'll be super never sick. You're going to get sick! <laughs> you will get sick. Every year, guess what? I get sick. And sometimes more than once. It's life. Can't stop it. We live in a fallen world. Now, can you do things to help you to not get as sick? Yeah. And look, I'm not against you taking your elderberry syrup and all that other stuff. Look, I'm not against it. I'm just saying that how are you different from a vaxxer when if, you know what, I didn't have my girl, I don't smoke today, I'm probably going to get sick. <laughs> it's just like a vaxxer saying, oh, I didn't get the, the virus in, injection, I'm going to get sick. It's the same thing. You're being, you're living in fear. Yeah. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Look, people can get mad at me all they want about that stuff, but it's the truth. Yeah. It's the truth. Amen. And look, if you don't want to have Western society, medicine, and all that stuff when you get sick, knock yourself out. Use whatever you want. I don't care. It's not, that's not my business, but you know, it is my business to teach you the Word of God. And I'm going to tell you what, if you live in fear of the fact that you didn't take, you know, you didn't eat organic grain, beef, grain or grass-fed beef this week, and you're going to get cancer from it. You're living in fear. You're living in fear. Stop it. Don't be the other side extreme. Just be normal. <laughs> Isn't that what Pastor Amanda said? Be normal. Just be, yeah. can't some people just be normal? Yeah. Be normal. Yeah. Just have a, a balance. You know? Don't be walking around being afraid of everything. Sanitation. Here's another way we can help ourselves. Wash your hands. When you go... <laughs> Don't go up and shake somebody's hand right after that. You know, why, you know, just be clean. Galatians chapter 2, or uh, Leviticus chapter 15, verse 13 says, And when he hath an issue, is cleansed of his issue, then shall number himself seven days for his cleansing, and wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in running water. That's like a shower, right? And shall be clean. You know what God says we're supposed to do? He doesn't say get 99.9% .9 germ-killing uh, stuff from the store, which I'm not saying that stuff doesn't work, 
But God didn't say that, did he? He didn't say wash your hands in whiskey. He said bathe your body with fle- or bathe your flesh with water. Yeah. Running water. Soap's not bad. It makes you smell a little bit good. Throw on a little deodorant. Um, or whatever it is you use, okay? Union Jack or whatever. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> Every man's jack. Whatever kind of healthy uh, underarm stuff you want to wear. Look, there's tons of verses about washing your body in, in water. Okay? Have a good, healthy lifestyle. Wash yourself with water. And look, we've instituted, like I said, the corona fist bump in this church. And in Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. Right there. It's right there in the Bible. That we should go unto the heathen and they under the circumcision. Now, in the Greek, that means gave to me. You know, it means gave to me the fist bump. That's what it says in the Greek. <laughs> Just saying. That's a joke. All right, joke. It doesn't really say that in the Greek, okay? <laughs> the right hand's a fellowship. So whether I shake your hand or I fist bump your hand, still give, I'm still giving you the right hand of fellowship. <laughs> and if you mess with me, I'll give you the right hand of fellowship this way. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway, so we're supposed to give the right hands of fellowship. That's cool. But it doesn't have to be a shake. It doesn't say shake. It could be a bump, all right? And look, quarantine is biblical. That's the last thing I'm going to say. Leviticus chapter 13, verse 3 says, And the priest shall look on the plague of the skin of flesh, and when the hair of the plague is turned white, and the plague in his sight is deeper than the skin of his flesh, it is a plague of leprosy. And the priest shall look on him and pronounce him unclean. If the bright spot be white, and the skin of the flesh, and inside it is not deeper than the skin, and the hair thereof be not turned white, then the priest shall shut up him that hath the plague seven years, or seven days, seven years, seven days, and the priest shall look upon him on the seventh day, and behold, if the plague of his right uh, and his sight be at a stay, and the plague spread not to the skin, then the priest shall shut him up seven days more. So, look, quarantine is a biblical concept. When you're sick, and you've got your nose is running, and you're coughing, then stay home. Yeah. You want to you not get the coronavirus? Then do what God says. Hey, if you're sick, quarantine yourself. That's cool. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But if you're afraid to come to church and you're not sick because other people are sick, then you're fearing. Right. You're in fear. You're living in fear. You've got the spirit of fear. And you've got to knock it off. Yep. All right? So hopefully this sermon helped you today. If anybody was on the fence about whether they were going to... I'm preaching to people that are in church this morning. So, you know, that's good. But there's people that aren't. And there's people that... Who knows why they stay home? But they do. So I'm just saying... Uh, Don't live in fear. Wash your hands. Fist bump. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this wonderful day. Pray that you bless us as we go soul winning. Pray you give us a spirit of boldness as we go out to preach. And Lord, help us to uh, reach those people that are in most need of Christ and that we would be able to get some saved today. Pray that you'd uh, help us to not have a spirit of fear in in a world and a nation that just promotes fear continually. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, help us not to have that spirit of fear creep into our church or into our lives. And Lord, you bless and take care of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.